makes a move of which we don't approve. Who is it that always intervenes? UN and OAS, they have their place, I guess. But first, send the Marines. We'll send them all we've got. John Wayne and Randolph Scott. Remember those exciting fighting scenes? To the shores of Tripoli, but not to Mississippi. What do we do? We send the Marines. For might makes right. Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, not to Mississippi so injunction to still holds. Um, <laughs> it seems like uh, President Trump is willing to send the Marines and the rest of the armed forces just about anywhere, anywhere that evildoers raise their heads. So today we are going to spend some time. The entire show, actually, uh, with uh, someone who's been on the show many other times before. Uh, Alexandra Petri has joined us to talk about vexillology, which is the study of flags and puns, uh, which she is some kind of champion. Uh, And now and other things as well. And now here at the end of the world, we thought it would be good to have her on for this, too. Uh, And the end of the world is a subject, one of many subjects. In fact, it would be easier to name the subjects not covered uh, in her new book, Nothing is Wrong. And here is why a collection of her very, very funny uh, essays. And uh, one of the ways that it turns out you would know it was the end of the world or a terrible crisis is it would be labeled better. You know, we'd probably say that somewhere. So, uh, Alexandra Petri, welcome back on perhaps not the funniest of days in perhaps not the funniest times. And perhaps that's something we have to talk about right away. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm glad we're here at a time when the president continues to bind up the nation's wounds and figure out solutions at a time when we need them the most uh, and just really pour oil on all the troubled waters of the nation, uh, just sensing the problems we're facing and rising to the occasion. That's that's our gentleman. So, um, <laughs> yes, that is our gentleman. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges, and I'm sure this gets said an awful lot to you these days, but one of the challenges of writing humor at a time like this is, of course, to kind of get ahead of reality, to write something that is discernibly humor as opposed to something that just happened 10 minutes ago. And, you know, I mean, one of the things I love about this particular book of uh, essays is that on at least one occasion, uh, the p- people who were the most confused about whether you were writing humor or simply describing reality as it lay in front of you were whoever it is at the White House who sends out some kind of daily news digest. Did one of your columns, one of your columns about the budget get sort of distributed as though it were, in fact, a pretty good analysis of things as they really stood? Yes, it, it did. I got to be real news briefly. Yeah. Uh, so I... I wonder if you could get like a real news credential. You, you need all the ballast you can in these in these t- times. Uh, but no, they mistook my all caps st- statement that Trump's budget will punch everything that is wrong with America into submission and an F-35 will be your new preschool teacher and all kinds of wonderful innovations like that for a genuine uh, endorsement of the budget. And so I got sent out in their daily email of good news, which now I'm subscribed to. And it's amazing how much good news there is. You wouldn't think it. You would think, you know, (laughs) we're in the throes of uh, an excruciatingly trying time as people are trying to correct injustices that have been going on for hundreds of years. And that until we as a nation recognize that Black Lives Matter and police brutality is unacceptable, we won't get very far. But no, it turns out the White House thinks other things are going on and that they're just proceeding from glory to glory, trailing clouds of wonder. Right. I mean, just to give people a sense. So some of the so the, the article, as many of Alexander's pieces are, they are sort of kind of false narratives. They appear to be I mean, sometimes, you know, it's a false narrative because it's a measles germ talking uh, to you. Uh, but sometimes in this case, it's yeah, it's a series of rationales for budget cuts and budget changes. So uh, just a bullet through a few of those corporation for public uh, broadcasting. Instead, a- anyone who turns on the radio will be able to hear audio footage of a Trump son shooting a rare land mammal national endowment for the arts the nea will be destroyed and replaced with an armored helicopter with a shark painted on it uh you know (laughs) that's art that's the (laughs) highest form of art really is painting sharks onto helicopters right and somehow or other they read this piece 
I, if I can just bore you for a second. So, you know, as I don't know whether you realize this or not, but I was, I was sort of once as you are now, but considerably less successful. So for many years, I was a newspaper humor writer. Uh, and, um, I, in 92 or no, it must've been 93, um, during the kind of don't ask, don't tell, uh, uh, argument. Uh, you were probably not even born or something, but uh, during the early stages of the Clinton administration, there was um, a whole big debate about, you know, whether it could be okay for gay people to be in the services. And people kept coming back to the idea, well, we, they all have to take showers together. And this just like came up all the time. So you really thought mainly what they do in the military is they take showers. And so I wrote this piece in which I, among other things, explained that President Clinton had said that he wouldn't ask a service member to do anything that he wouldn't do. So he was going to shower with a gay man at least once a week, you know, for the foreseeable future. And that gay men who did this, who volunteered to do this, would receive a silver pin in the shape of a duck and a shower cap with the White House seal on it. And then I went on to describe the incredible importance of military showers and why they had made us a superior military power. And two things happened. One of them was the next day I was contacted my my column often ran in newspapers where people had never read anything that i'd written before i was i had this agonizing conversation with this gay man who wanted to sign up for the program and had called the white house um uh, about taking a shower with president clinton and oh no uh, he, he was ready to go there for the country and was, you had to yes right he was oh, going to he was going to take one for the team and he'd been transferred around a lot by the White House because nobody seemed to know about this program. And uh, some, finally, somebody irritably suggested he call the person who wrote it. But then the fun part, this is more like your one. I also was contacted by this very, very fundamentalist church in Florida, which was grateful that somebody had finally understood this whole shower question and how important an unimpeded shower is to the American military and why they'd been, why that had contributed to our military might. And they wanted to know if they could rerun my column in their church newsletter, which I immediately assented to do. And then about a week later, somebody told them that it was not a serious column and they got very angry. But that's, I don't know about you. I think that's really, that's the highest compliment in a way, you know, that they, they just, you know, they looked at it and saw something that you completely didn't intend. You, know, you sometimes wonder if it's a compliment or if it's an insult that I, depending on how I'm feeling on a given day, it, like right. Trump's personal wealth, which fluctuates depending on his general sense of, you know, how well he's doing and he can gain a billion dollars in a morning and lose a billion dollars. I sort of feel that way when, you know, I'm on a grand joyous feeling. I think, ah, it's good. I've done good satire. And then on a, downer day i'll think oh no they couldn't even tell it was satire i failed completely <laughs> so you go, you go back around yeah i think jonathan swift had the same thing he just vacillated back and forth you know no, i wonder if he it. got like pigeons or messages of other forms from people saying you know i for a long time i've been thinking what you said you finally had the guts. someone finally <laughs> had the guts to say the thing about eating the babies and i just i'm so glad somebody really put it forward because those are the worst emails those are the ones where you think oh no uh Pose law is kicking in. Everything is deeply broken. Instead of the ones that are like, you know, oh, I see what you did there, you whippersnapper, or how dare you espouse such a bad opinion. Those are sort of reassuring. Yeah. But the ones where people say, yes, ah, finally the truth of our showers, finally the truth of let's eat those succulent infants. Right. Those are somewhat dispiriting, I find. And speaking of seeing what you did there, I noticed that pigeons were the early Twitter. That's basically what you just did. Um, so, um, and it also must be a struggle these days. You know, like you just did a column from the point of view of Mike Pompeo's dog, uh, mm -hmm. which means that a few days later when the president, who's, you know, holed up in his White House on a Friday night with the lights off, I still, I can't get over, I keep saying this, but it's, it is like the place where they don't give out candy on Halloween, like they turn all the lights off and everything so the trick-or-treaters won't come. But uh, And he, he tweets, big crowd, professionally organized, but nobody came close to breaching the fence. If they had, they would have been greeted with the most vicious dogs and most ominous <laughs> weapons I have ever seen. That's when people would have been really badly hurt, at least. Um, there's so many things. I mean, if we were to parse that tweet, there's so many things. But had you not already expended your, you know, twice a year dog allotment on my, my, Mike Pompeo's dog, you could have written a column from the point of view of one of those dogs who doesn't consider himself vicious. Yeah. And you would also hope that the dogs, I mean, you hope that everyone across the board, if they get it, sort of an unconstitutional order from the president to enact <laughs> violence on American citizens, you hope even the dogs will maybe understand that that's not in the job description. But, um, 
no, I think it's an amazing feat of courage, but it's also deeply, you know, sad and bewildering and real people are getting hurt. So yeah. it's, it would be in a movie, you would think this is comical and over the top. And I can't believe this gentleman's expressing these, I mean, ominous dogs. It's like that sketch. Are we the baddies? You know, yeah. uh, when you're boasting about your ominous dog, that's never a sign that you're really uh, just the forces of light and truth marshalling themselves in glorious format. But, you know, there's actual people who are going to be on the receiving ends of those ominous dogs. And so it's ah, it's an awful thing. I know it, it is. And I think that is part of the struggle. Well, I mean, I should just ask you, um, you know, ordinarily your mission uh, is to take fairly serious matters and make people see something funny about them. Um, but maybe this particular moment has kind of exceeded your own capacity to, to feel that way. I mean, I'm kind of sensing that in what you're saying. Well, I think the trouble with the current administration has been for a long time that everything is absurd, but nothing is funny because people are getting hurt. So it's Hopefully you can at least make people see what's absurd about it and try to at least use the tools of column writing and humor to make an argument about why, if this is true, what follows from it and what a sort of perverse world you're trapped in by the erroneous sentences that people create to sort of conceal from themselves what they're doing. And if you can try to puncture that and say, hey, look, here's what's what I think at least is going on, sometimes you hope you can convince someone. And sometimes your email inbox just fills up with people calling you rude names. But right. that's part of the job. Um, I think also, I mean, for me, it has been interesting to watch over the last 48 hours, you know, various people trying to find some way to fit what happened on Monday evening into their understanding of their roles. And Mike Esper has been really interesting to watch because really, I mean, I don't know if, if this has crossed your, popped up in your phone yet, but I mean, he, he, today he kind of just disavowed the whole project. But I think it was last night that he was saying, you know, I didn't know where we were walking. I mean, I thought and we we're going to walking over there, there we saw, was, but I thought we were going to like talk to the troops. I didn't know anything about like, I didn't know we were doing like a photo or a Yeah, I think he thought he said, he said they thought they were going to visit a bathroom maybe or <laughs> So, like just ideas for where he thought that they were going. I love because the post style section did this wonderful oral history of the year that was the 48 minutes that led to that photo op. But I would also love to know what was going through his mind during every minute that he was walking over and watching this unfold. Uh, like where he thought they were going, then where he thought they were going, then what he thought was happening. Uh <laughs> No, absolutely, and 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 he's probably thinking whose Bible it was, right? Yeah, it was, yeah, that and, A Bible that was it, getting lovingly hoisted <laughs> in front of a large crowd, which not only shows that he's religious, but also shows his immense strength. So right. I think you know we got a double whammy there because well, those I mean, are heavy books. He really um, did have that initial moment of. I mean, once again, you can't script these things. He had this initial moment of kind of turning it over a couple of times, like, how does this thing work? You know, do you like pull on them? Do you pull on this part of it to open it? Um, it I mean, it seems like such a foreign object, but I love the idea of Esper who's walking over there and then he's thinking, okay, maybe after the Bible photo, is, that's when we go look at the bathroom. Um, and he's like turning to Ivanka and saying, nice handbag. Do you know when it is we're gonna go talk to the troops and look, is it after this? Um, I mean, apparently you, you don't even get briefed, right? You just have to start walking with him. Yeah, no, which I think is the Trump experience in a nutshell. You're absolutely. So, I mean, to me, and to be semi-serious for a second, you know, after the 48 minutes that was an entire year, I mean, I kind of have, I mean, to me, I was sitting here in my house. Uh, my significant other had been kind enough. I'd been out in the woods with the dog and I came back, an actual real dog, by the way, not a vicious or ominous dog. Uh, and uh, she had been kind enough to tape what had just happened. She said, I'm going to rewind this. You're not going to believe this. Uh, and, and so I watched it. And then to me, it did seem like, okay, that's a real departure. That's a pretty sharp turn even for this you know, dumpster fire. This is really, you know, scary and weird. And, and then I kind of waited for the denunciations to come from Republicans. 
And it's like they're just it's what it's Ben Sass and Tim Scott and and W sort of, you know, I mean, it's it's interesting the way W has kind of emerged these days as this voice of sanity or something. And I was like, I wish we had a voice of sanity that hadn't been involved in the Iraq war. But, man, <laughs> uh, it's it involved as though it, 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 a involved is one of those verbs that does a lot of work for getting people off the hook for things. But no, the, it, people were going, I think reporter Casey Hunt was asking everyone in the hallway, sort of, what do you think of this? And they were all saying, I have to go get lunch. You know, I, I can't speak to you now. I'm turning into a bird. Ka, ka. I can't, you know, I, I'm not here. I'm not in right now. Uh, I don't follow the news. I try not to be political. You know, if I speak, if I say anything courageous about the president, between now and the end of his term, my brothers will all turn back into geese and we can't have that. You know, just everyone had some reason for not saying anything, uh, pr- presumably having recognized that the legislature is now, you know, largely decorative and ought not to be taken out too often, uh, <laughs> unless it collapsed. So it's, it's like the good China. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so the, I, I feel like I'm smelling a Petri column. Is, is this column uh, already up on the internet or is it coming out? I, it, in it's, it's making its way towards the uh, Maw of publication as we speak. Yeah. I mean, well, they, they, they teed this up for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, that, I mean, the difficulty is the actual things that they were saying was, were just as, as, as usual, were, what you would hope you would make up as a joke to show an example of something too absurd for someone to say in response to a scene like that. Well, you could just say something like, these are vital protests against a serious injustice that's been woven into the American fabric for a long time. And I can't believe the president fired, had urged people to fire tear gas at them. This is nonsense. This is not America. And instead people are saying things like, my heart hurts. Sorry. Uh, gotta have lunch. There were two. I've gotta go have lunch, which I really want to know what lunch was awaiting them on the other end of this to make it worth it. Yeah, something that but, needs to be served at a certain certain temperature, anyway. Oh yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, it's Vichy Soise. <laughs> the Vichy Soise will get warm. Yeah. So yeah, Vichy Soise. Vichy uh, Soise. Ah, I see what you did. Oh, you 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 you're just flashing your pun champion thing right there. Um, well, you know, not only that. I don't know if you caught this one, but. Because it's so hard. You can't keep track of all of this. But you were just talking about they fired tear gas at them. And then the Trump campaign demanded a correction saying it was not tear gas. It was, it was not effort. either. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you take it. Yeah, yeah, they were saying it's, it's like it's a, and which also, as Megan Kelly pointed out years ago, was a food product. So it's <laughs> not even. But also it wasn't the case. I mean, the CDC. But yeah, they were trying to. If there's one thing that has been a constant of the Trump administration, as long as there's been a Trump administration, it's been looking at a crowd of people and saying that happens in a certain way and saying, no, I want that crowd to have happened differently. I want there to have been more people or fewer people. I want to change the gas that was fired at them. Like, can we fix this in post? That's sort of an unfortunate theme. (laughs) Yeah. So, no, they uh, and it's you got to sort of I bet nobody from the CDC really kind of made the statement. I think somebody probably had to look it up on some CDC book of gases or something. Uh, but it, it does turn out that it was chloroactophenone, more commonly referred to as mace or pepper spray. Uh, and according to the CDC, oh, no, there's another compound, too. There's uh, uh, one of the most commonly used tear gases in the world, uh, according to an article in the British Medical Journal. That was sort of the point when I realized maybe tear gas isn't even like a specific thing. It's like a category of things. There are, there's like a bunch of tear gases. Yeah. It depends on what your definition of tear gas is. And that's, uh, you don't, it's one of those sentences where you hear yourself saying it and you think, you know, if I, if me two weeks ago could hear me now, uh, you don't even have to go back very far. Right. No, but uh, you definitely it was the Trump campaign was going, it wasn't tear gas. It was some gas that you shoot at people and it comes out and it makes them cough and vomit and cry and they can't catch their breath. You know, it was something like that, but it wasn't tear gas. Why Why are you saying tear gas? Uh, which is sort of an interesting distinction to make. You know, even if it really were a real distinction, it would be. Yeah. No, what an incredibly bleak, bleak distinction to be trying to hang your head on and make and it's just i mean they're just trying to obscure the fact of the violence it's it's, this is the kind of sentence that keeps happening over and over again where it's like 
when the autopsy report came out on George Floyd and they were saying that, you know, he, it could have been potential intoxicants and he wasn't like, or people said, well, it, it, someone knelt on him. And instead of saying he was killed by a police officer, it's just sort of these ways of alighting how violence happens to people's bodies. It, it, and even just that sentence there, I said, how violence happens to people's bodies. It wasn't people firing canisters of tear gas. No, they. they are there, I hope there's somebody at the Trump campaign jotting that down right now. What did she say again? How violence happens to people's bodies. That's good. We like yeah, that. No, it's, it's these wonderful passive verbs that come riding into the rescue. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a little break here. We're talking to Alexandra Petri. Her new book is called Nothing Is Wrong, and here is why. Uh, yeah, actually, and... We need to just issue st stickers for the front that says everything instead right. of nothing. But... Or, yeah, you, or you could do it like a lot of stickers where people could kind of you know, it's like those uh, refrigerator magnet things where you can make poems and stuff like that. You could just offer a bunch of options tucked in the, the inside of the cover where people can can sort of adjust the title on a daily basis, maybe even. Yeah, like a barometer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back with more Alexandra after this. All right. Uh, we are back. Uh, we are talking uh, now to Alexandra Petri, uh, who is a very, very funny writer for The Washington Post and the author of Nothing is Wrong. And here is why uh, a collection of essays. Uh, and I'm having. Well, never mind. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. We should actually talk maybe about some of the pieces uh, that uh, are in the book. Some of them are very similar to the conversation we're having right now. For example, there is a piece uh, in. Actually, no, I'll go back and say. One of the ones that I, I kind of loved because I'd forgotten the whole thing, even though it was in 2017, which is not such a long time ago. But this guy named Walter Schaub, who was the head of the government office of ethics, had resigned and had written a resignation letter uh, to the Trump administration. And and you wrote the letter that he really wanted to write, which was entirely about like being invisible. It's like the guy who pushes the elevator button and it doesn't light up. Um, and uh, in a way, Alexandra, as is so often the case, reality I, I, sort of catches up with that column. I mean, you were spot on in 2017, but it's sort of even truer now or something. Yeah, no, it's funny because now he's actually on the Internet and we can see like that actually probably was what he would have written. Uh, so uh, which was no, it's it's strange reading some of these in retrospect because some of them i think that feels like it was not one year ago but 30 years ago and i look at my hands and they're all withered and i'm like have i been traveling on a <laughs> ship all this time should i have set foot on land oh no my crew is crumbling into dust but uh some of them you think oh that's that's still happening and that's <laughs> unfortunate Right. I mean, this that, this essay, which it really is one of my favorites, uh, he, at one point he, he says, sometimes I send an email with very pointed italics saying, this doesn't seem OK, but not even crickets. No, you know, nobody even makes a noise. Um, a, a lot of your right. Well, let me also back up. Does, is there this is sort of a kind of dumb interviewer kind of question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Were there people who really inspired you? I mean, I personally remember having reading certain certain writers who I thought were funny and thinking I, I wonder if I could do that is that a job do people get that job can I have that job did you have people like that for you oh absolutely I mean one of the people I always come back to is Robert Benchley because oh. he just in like the 20s uh, James Thurber said anything funny he ever wrote he would look and he would discover that 30 years ago Robert Benchley had just effortlessly written it uh, and it's true he's written on pretty much everything and the only things of his that don't immediately make you laugh at things where he's just describing a phenomenon that no longer exists. So he'll be like, boy, I sure hate traveling in a Pullman car. It's very inconvenient. And you think, I, I wish I could resemble these remarks. But all the stuff where he's describing like how you procrastinate, where he's like, I can, a man can do any amount of work provided it's not the work he's supposed to be doing at that time. 
and then he describes how whenever he has something important to do, he tells himself that he actually has to do something else. And then he does all of these other things and he winds up doing his important task just to procrastinate on the other thing he told himself was more important. And it completely makes sense and is as true as the day it was written. So I really do love him. And he has this sort of baffled yet pointed way of writing, which he has this real distinctive authorial voice Yes, uh, I, I too. I have to interject two things. One of them is I don't know. You've probably read "Why We Laugh." If we do, I think that's the name of the essay. <laughs> that's a good title. Yeah, it's a, it's an it's an analysis of laughter uh, and why we laugh. Of course, being eventually, it, it's nothing of the kind. But there's this incredibly complicated. It's very Petri like. I actually can see the connection here because at one point he uh, he talks about a, a boarding house, a joke about a boarding house, and a man who puts a horse in the bathroom, and the landlady finds out, and she says, "Why." did you do this? And he said, because when everybody else wakes up and says, there's a horse in the bathroom, I want to be able to say, I know. And then he analyzes this joke from every possible perspective. Um, and, uh, and it is, it's very uh, like you and it's effortless. And, and Thurber and White, I, there's a correspondence that they're having about how they're both very funny writers, but they consider themselves to be miserable. You know, Thur Thurber was a truly unhappy, messed up oh, kind yeah, of person. Deeply. And they're just talking about how unhappy they are and how awful life is. And then they start talking about Benchley and they just they can't understand how he can be so funny and be so untroubled, too. I think one of them says he laughs, he sings. Um, and, and I guess that was sort of the other part of his personality, too. He just he didn't have that kind of misery thing going with the humor. Yeah, no, it's strange because he, he and Dorothy Parker were, they shared an office, I think, back in the old New Yorker in, in the day. And Dorothy Parker said, like, one inch well, or a foot sh smaller, and it would have been adultery. Um, but, <laughs> like, it was a tiny office, and they were buds. And she was, of course, not uh, a beam of sunshine and ray of light either, but was deeply funny and acerbic. And so it's, it's strange to think of somebody like Benjley and someone like her hanging out as much as they did. And, yeah. So when I asked you that question about influence, I didn't think you were going to go quite so far back, but that's very good and very impressive. Uh, anybody else who sort of made you sort of feel like, oh, yeah, perhaps I have the power to fly the way that person does? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, of Internet writers, Ali Brosh is a big one. Uh, just all of the her MS Paint cartoons, it, it, it has that characteristic of all really excellent jokes where you think, oh, that must surely have existed before time. And this person just sort of came along and discovered it. Like they just feel that true. Like a, a lot of fire where the a lot is a creature. And so whenever someone misspells a lot, she just thinks of this creature. It's, I mean, just clean all the things, just these phrases that seem like they must always have existed anyway. So she's tremendous. Uh, I'm a big fan of the toast. Long may its memory be a blessing. <laughs> and I mean, Lindy West, who was the pioneer of all capital letter writing, for sure. <laughs> so, I mean, I, one thing that I know from my own experience and that we also share is, you know, you read these other people and they were very, very funny, but they were kind of or they are very funny in the case of some of the people that you just mentioned. But they tend to be funny on their own schedule. You know, I mean, it's, you know, Thurber wrote something funny when he felt like writing something funny. Uh, and when you do it for a newspaper on a schedule and I didn't in the old days, did you go into the newsroom? Were you like in, in the building a lot of the time? I would be, although I would find that when I was in the building, everyone there was so interesting and you would have, it, it suddenly it would be 9 PM and I wouldn't have filed anything at all. And <laughs> so I would just sort of sit there at my desk. I would eat disgusting things from the vending machine. So I would often work from a place that wasn't the office so that when I was done working, I could, leave because there's this magic this magnetism of an office where you just sort of sit, sit there and you think just by sitting here i'm doing good a good and exciting thing right. and then it's 9 p.m and people are going around turning out the lights and starting to vacuum <laughs> they, they aren't actually i mean it's a newsroom the newsroom never sleeps right. but uh you know metaphorically that and so yeah no but having to work from home instead of getting to work from home that's all the difference in the world right. Right. So, so how's that working out for you, writing from home? Um, it's, I have my little routine where I get my coffee and I sort of wander around the kitchen, open the refrigerator, close the refrigerator, uh, <laughs> just ri riveting stuff like that. But you like to feel that you're still doing some sort of a commute and that 
you have to get from one place to another, even if that place is only uh, from your bedroom to the large table on which you pile up newspapers. I've got sort of a nest where I've got like old newspapers and mail that I haven't opened and books and things. And that's where I do most of my uh, writing. Well, you know, it is. Uh, so one of my early mentors and somebody who was kind enough to really support me early on was Roy Blunt Jr. And he has this great idea, oh, cool. which I've mentioned on the year in the past. But uh, so apologies if you listen regularly, because but I have to share it with Alexandra now. So he said that one of the problems with being a writer at home is that you are always just about to start writing. You're <laughs> just about to start yes. writing. But nobody believes that because no. they haven't seen you do anything. Uh, but you are just about, you are not available to help repot an azalea because you are just about to start writing. But the other person looks at you and says, well, she's not, she could help because she's not doing anything. So his, yeah. th his theory is we, we need coveralls with our names on them, you know, to like just sort of work, work garb, like a coverall that you would pull on. It would say Alexandra sort of on the breast pocket. And then that would mean that you are at work. You're about, you are going to write something right now because you just you put your cover all on. Oh, yeah. No, you can put some sort of like a visor, maybe like a little <laughs> green visor. I don't know. That, that just implies like meticulous, painstaking work. So I think that could be a good asset as well. I, I like this idea because I feel like often when you're staring at the wall, no one realizes that the staring at the wall is integral to your process. But then again, it's also like the neat thing, as you mentioned about being on a newspaper schedule is you can't get too precious about your process because otherwise they'll say, you know, it's been eight weeks and we've noticed nothing from you. And you're like, yes, but when it eventually comes out, it will be Ulysses. And that's not reassuring to an editor who was hoping it would be like a 400 to 800 word piece on what was going on that day. And not in fact, a incomprehensible novel based on the writings of Homer. So, you know, you're really up a creek if that's the choice you go. Yeah, I think First of all, I feel your pain. Um, but I think also the the compensating factor is that unlike James Joyce or unlike James Thurber or unlike a lot of people whose first name is James, you know, th there's a way in which when you're writing for a newspaper and you're writing humor that's quote unquote off the news. I mean, the news does. I used to have one editor who when I would make fun of something that was happening in the public sphere, he would just simply say they make it too easy for you. Um, and there is sort of a way in which, you know, James Joyce didn't have to wait for Paul Manafort to do something stupid uh, or no, I no, should put no it the other way. No one ever has to wait for Paul Manafort to do anything <laughs> stupid. No, that's true. But I should put it the other way. James Joyce didn't have Paul Manafort rushing forward so cooperatively into the metaphorical arms of Alexander P. Dry by doing something stupid, right? I mean, there's a way in which there's a whole bunch of people who are just churning out stuff for you to work on. Well, in a, yeah, I mean, in a sense, there, if you just go by the sheer volume of people doing alarming things, the volume certainly feels very high if you're looking at it from a news perspective. But it, it, so the problem becomes not, we, oh, gosh, w w the world is so beautifully ordered and things are going so nicely. I'm going to really have to have difficulty uh, finding anything that's wrong in the world. But that's really never been a problem since the dawn of writing. I mean, you didn't have like Voltaire sitting around being like, things are going so well. Uh, I hope there's an earthquake soon. You never hope for an earthquake. You really would prefer to have to be fine tuning things that are basically working really well. And so you're just like hinges these days are terrible and we got to deal with them. Like that would be <laughs> gravy. <laughs> Um, no, instead the hinges are on cages and they put children in the cages. Um, and so it becomes, you know, uh, it's exactly what you're saying. We, we don't want this kind of material. Stop giving us this material. We'll just write about the hinges. And yeah, although like Paul Manafort and like sort of the, 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 the carpet nonsense. Like I enjoy that sort of a thing because it's like, oh, help. I, I couldn't refuse. And now I've been covered in antique carpets and have spent thousands of dollars. And there's something sort of you know, it's not, there's no people being crushed inside that story. It's just corruption. Uh, and that's, that's sort of uh, not victimless necessarily, but a, a much lower impact form of thing to prod at. No, 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 um, no people being crushed. But as I recall, ostriches, right? Was, was that, oh, was, yeah, the ostriches. Yeah. Oh, man. I haven't thought about those ostriches in a while. I hope they're doing well. Well, I mean, and the other question is, 
was it a jacket? It was an ostrich jacket, wasn't it? Yeah. So Which, why? Yeah, I mean, make ostrich hat. Sure, I get it, but <laughs> and, ostrich and, jacket. It just it doesn't even seem very ostrichtacious. No, that doesn't. <laughs> it's it's, it's ostrich. <laughs> that fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I find myself wondering. First of all. Like with an ostrich, well, no, I guess anything you make out of an ostrich, the ostr you're not going to have any ostrich left over at the end of this. <laughs> um, but if it seems like a jacket might What do you might do with the feet now yeah. that I'm thinking about it? Yeah. Be just as a party gag, maybe? Yeah, you, you just – now I'm picturing you go to someone's house and there are just these enormous ostrich feet on the wall. And I think, oh, well, my question's been answered. But also I must leave immediately. <laughs> Nothing good goes on in this place. <laughs> So, by the way, we're referring to an actual piece in the book called How P Paul Manafort Came by $934,350 in Antique Carpets. Uh, we're talking to Alexandra Petri uh, right now. So uh, we're going to take a little break, our final break. We'll come back with the, the ever-popular more after the ever-popular this. We couldn't stand to see our children shot dead in the streets. But when I finally took a knee, them crackers took me out the lead. All right, so we're back. Um, so I had to do, I had to perform a very uh, difficult operation during the break, which is that uh, Declan, my dog, who's usually in this room while I'm talking, suddenly started barking at something during the break, and I had to sort of get him out of the room and slam the door really fast and run back to my little chair here. And that's what passes for action uh, when you're working from home. Oh, that's like wow. A, that's, that's a big a action scene. Minute. Yeah, big action scene. Uh, so the other voice you hear is, in fact, Alexandra Petri. Her new book is Nothing is Wrong, and here is why. I have to uh, pause and thank Kat Pastor, who is there in the studio, making it possible for me to work from home, and for Betsy Kaplan, who is the producer of this uh, particular episode, to also work from her home. Uh, and uh, so thanks to them and to everybody else who helps out with everything. Um, tomorrow on the show, uh, this almost has a I, maybe because I've been reading Alexandra Petri's collection, I sort of think, well, this could be a Petri thing. This could be a Petri thing. But we are doing a show. Um, it's it might be a little bit late. I don't know. Uh, but you 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 may have noticed early in the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, there's a lot of reporting on sort of how quiet things were getting because people were not like tromping around on the face of the earth. There's not an actual tectonic impact that we make, apparently, like we make a lot of noise and we were making less noise and birds were happier and goats were taking over villages in Wales because there's nobody around to bother, like maybe wild goats or something. I don't know. Anyway. You can tell I'm not producing this episode. Jonathan McPants will be. But we're, we're doing kind of a world without us episode. Like we got a little bit of taste about like how much happier the world would be if we would just go away completely uh, by going away partly. So that more or less is the theme of tomorrow's show. Uh, Alexandra Petri is with us right now. So having been in your shoes, having had collections of humor out, this is many, many decades ago. And then having to go be interviewed about them and wondering what I was going to be asked and whether they, I was going to get to. I, I want to sort of just turn things around and say, is there anything you want to talk about, like a particular piece in this book that you want to talk about or part of your process? Or, uh, you know, I'm just going to throw the floor open to you right now. Ooh, well, I think now that the tables have been turned, oh, this was the one question I was hoping no one would ask me. <laughs> okay, I could <laughs> withdraw it. Yeah, no, don't, don't withdraw it. I'm trying to think of some really illuminating and grand insight because I feel like there's the, the trouble with promoting a book of humor is it's sort of like when people, like you announce that you're a sculptor and they're like, and people hand you some potato salad and they're like, all right, show us what you can do with it. It's sort of hard to try to be funny while talking about a thing that- right. Is, is, is sort of a strange balancing act because there's also nothing less funny than people trying to explain their grand theory of humor to you. Right. It just the it's that whole poking a dead frog thing. Right. So, Although I will say this, um, just to invoke Roy Blunt a second time on the show today, the one good the one good theory of humor that I've ever encountered, and this is back in back in the 1980s, people actually uh, wrote letters and put them in the mail, and then you'd wait and you get a letter back. And so Roy Blunt and I went through a period where we were writing back and forth, and he, in the middle of a letter, articulated the idea of being funnier than necessary. He said that the the way that humor succeeds is 
by being funnier than necessary. There's, you know, one, the simplest joke is not enough. The, the really good humor, and I think it, yours is definitely in this category, is that kind of keeps coming at you. It keeps kind of piling up on you. You know, it isn't just, I mean, you could start with a concept. Uh, for example, there's a piece in your book, one of the maybe riskier pieces. It was, I think, based on a New York Times poll about what percentage of people would kill Hitler as a baby. Uh, and so you turn around and work off of that. Well, that's a pretty funny and daring high wire concept to sort of argue against killing baby Hitler. Um, but I mean, you have to have so much more than that, right? You, there, there has to be a kind of a richness, uh, a, a lot of presence that the reader can open as they go along. And I think that is a good theory of humor. I think too much humor is just just barely funny enough oh well i'm glad that you mentioned that one actually because that is one of my favorites because i feel like it was fun to try to one of my favorite things to do when you're writing is that you take a concept and you try to live inside like what would it look like if you actually were to do this thing and sort of what follows from the bizarre assumption that people have just sort of casually thrown out if they're like a ufo believer like what else has to be true from that and then maybe so like you're going back in time with baby hitler and it also was a time which I guess continues into the present where people are always having very strong opinions about the way other people are parenting. And so the idea was that what if instead of just, you know, taking baby Hitler and doing away with him, you try to do a better job of rearing him and that became its, its own thing. I don't know, I'm very attached to that piece because I, th I think hopefully you it just, I enjoy getting to, peer out from inside the creepy vase of whatever concept it is. I don't know why it's a vase. Uh, that, that may be less funny than necessary, but. Uh, <laughs> a vase? Yeah, no, see, yeah, no oh. it needs to be a funnier kind of vessel. We'd have to work on that, I think. Yeah, fix it uh, in post. Right. Um, but yeah, and I, I think also that kind of piece, I mean, first of all, there it, it is, to go back to Jonathan Swift, um, there's a risk attached to it. I mean, not the risk that people will think that you really seriously want to do a year-by-year -year parenting guide to Hitler and that you really are attached to that idea in a serious way. I don't think that risk is there like it was with, with Swift. But there just is a risk where people are thinking, well, I reject this concept at all because this thing that you're doing you you shouldn't be doing and the problem i don't know if you find this i think these are the best or some of the best pieces are the ones you probably shouldn't be writing from a lot of people's point of view well, i think with that one because the underlying fear when you're a parent i assume not being a parent myself but you know hoping to someday be a parent is that you're going to raise hitler i mean basically you you hope that in some way and of course like people grow up the way they grow up. And so there's a lot of fear of like, is there anything I can do? I know people will turn out certain ways, but is there anything I could potentially do that will result in, you know, young Gilbert not growing up to maybe not naming him Gilbert would be a good start. I don't know. And so you think, well, I can't play Wagner to him. Wagner gives people the urge to invade places. And you start making a list of stuff that seems like it didn't work in his case. And, you know, should I encourage the art? Should I discourage the art? What's going on here? Like, how do I? And so I feel like there's a lot of like actual, even though it's framed this way, it's about things that people really are thinking about all of the time when they're trying to bring up kids in this world. It's like, how do I make a better person than myself? How do I try to make somebody who will make the world marginally better and shift things and like go out and, and be protesting and doing and trying to make a nicer, uh, more whole America? And so even though it was, it sounds like it's about a risky topic, it's actually about sort of, I don't know, things that people care about deeply, I hope. And I think right. a lot of the things that, where it, you see the headline and you think, what's this going to be? Hopefully, by the time you get down in, in there, it's just as true as I can make it. Right. And I think what people don't get about the process of writing a piece like this is that it doesn't work. You can't do it unless you are prepared. Once you think of the funny idea, you have to be prepared to think very seriously uh, from that perspective, whatever that perspective is, whether you're writing from the perspective of a measles, measles germ uh, or somebody who's trying to bring up Hitler the right way, you have to then shift into a fairly serious embrace of that perspective and, and dwell there, which I don't know about you, but when I've had to do that, it actually is kind of fun, right? Yeah, no, I think trying to think about what it's like to be another perspective of person or even a measle. I mean, 
really awful things can happen when people think that they're doing their best. And if you think, what does it look like? What, what, does this person think they're doing the best that they possibly can? And what are the outcomes of that? And like, what other strange things have to be true about their world for them to behave the way that they are? Sometimes you can get some either amusing or terrifying or both answers. And so I think it's often worth doing. Right. I mean, a lot of your pieces are political in that way. There's one that I was reading out loud in the House not too long ago uh, about uh, a Republican explaining why he or she is not alarmed by Trump, even though it's increasingly clear that he is a giant poisonous spider, a kind of big Lord of the Rings third book type spider. Um, but I mean, one of the things that you do, I think, which is very much in the tradition of Thurber and Benchley is you embrace that idea. I mean, you at no point acknowledge in any way that he isn't a spider. Yeah, you know, you got to commit to the bit. Once you're in there, uh, you have to really hunker down and get that full Shelob action. That's what I've always. <laughs> that was an impressive grab there. <laughs> Coming up with the name of the spider. I would have been here a long time trying to think of the name of that spider. No, mm. well, I mean, you know, you're always just proud to see a woman succeeding in whatever field she's in. And like, even when she's like biting people and <laughs> filling them with venom and wrapping them up, you just think, wow, I'm just, you know, more jobs for females, uh, murder spiders. Right. And really, did those two stupid hobbits have any, anywhere that important to go that she had to, you know, yeah, meet, no, meet such just, an ugly end? Um, and, and that, by the way, is a lot of the fun, right? It's, it is sort of taking that alternative perspective uh, and exploring it. All right. We, I'm being told we just have minutes left. I guess I want to quickly ask you, uh, coronavirus, also not innately hilarious, but somehow or other you've been able to find funny things. Once again, I think by sort of taking a perspective that it's not really yours. Well, I think also one of the things about it is that it's something everyone's living inside and having to deal with. And so you can say, well, here's what I'm seeing from here. And sort of that moment of making eye contact with people, you can get at least a recognition laugh, if not necessarily like we're this situation's objectively humorous, which of course isn't. And it's devastating illness. But like when you get in your inbox an email from like a whitewater kayaking experience that you went to six years ago for a bachelorette that was canceled. Uh, and they're like, here's what we're doing about the coronavirus or just things like that are definitely absurd. And, you know, you can like all the tinkly piano commercials where, you know, I, I really wanted to know what, like it's urgent now in these trying times to buy a Subaru more than ever. Just some of these things are palpably absurd. And so I think the absurdity persists even uh, as everyone's pulling together and trying to do their best. And right. one of the hopeful things about it, like there's a great XK, XKCD recently that was like, actually, if you look, one of the most popular things in the world right now, like even more popular than Tom Hanks or Betty White is people trying to do their best for other people and not uh, take the precautions lightly and not spread the virus around as best they can. So it's, you know, there's actually causes for optimism. Right. Well, and we have to stop here uh, because the show is over, but I could go on with you forever. And yes, we are all in this together. Some of us are in a Subaru and we're all in this together. How about you? How about you getting in a Subaru? Uh, nothing is wrong. And here is why our essay is by Alexandra Petri, who is very fun and very funny. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right. Run out and get this book. You really can't run out anywhere, but do whatever it is that you do to get books. And then you'll have this book and you'll walk around the house reading it out loud to the other person in the house. And if there's not another person in the house, that should worry you. <laughs> Four, and there is now. That should also worry you. 